Welcome to Focus Today. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson. As always, great to have uh, Patrick Doyle in the house. Patrick uh, heads up uh, Veritas Counseling. And I got to tell you, today's uh, topic is, um, I'm going to say for adults only. Okay? <laughs> I, I, and I say that uh, respectfully. Uh, it's a very difficult topic. And um, we also want to give you an opportunity to call in, and we also want to give you an opportunity to remain anonymous. Mm. Our phone number is 541-776-5368. That's for the immediate Medford area, 541-776-5368. If you're listening or watching anywhere else in the Dove listening and viewing area, you're more than welcome to call in toll-free, and that's 800-373-5368. Uh, Patrick heads up Veritas Counseling, and of course, he's our resident counselor here at the Dove. And um, we want to talk about emotional abuse, uh, probably mm-hmm. the core of 90% of your counseling. A lot of it. Um, what I get, you know, uh, in the way of people mm-hmm. coming to my office, I realize that they've mm-hmm. been pretty beat up. Yeah. Where do we start with this? How would you define emotional abuse? Well, there's a big difference between somebody being emotionally abused and. Um, physically abused where, where it's obvious and before I get into the description I, I want to tell you a little story and, and read something from someone that um, ha- went through this process that will help explain that question so um, I'm, I, w- I was aware of a situation with a woman who is in another state her husband very well respected man um, but was early in the marriage physically violent to the wife and the children and then as time went on uh, became very intimidating and emotionally abusive. Okay, but he was a he's a he's a stalwart member of the church, very respected. But he kept this kept going on until finally the woman um, started to realize through some counseling that um, and and also there was a <laughs> a long term porn addiction for the man, um, and so she started to speak up. Well, her church didn't really get it. They, they, they didn't really understand what she was trying to say. They, they, they genuinely wanted to help, but they thought that she was maybe making this stuff up or, you know, how could this be? We all think this guy's great, yada, yada, yada. So time goes on, and sure enough, as she continues to make these statements and, and as she becomes more and more bold about revealing the truth, the, um, the, the pastor of the church gets it. Now, the, the pastor of this church, is a, it's a very large church on the East Coast, you know, like eight or 9,000 members, I think. And um, so he, he started to realize, <laughs> she actually went in his office and made him watch my show on, emo- on emotional abuse. Here? Yeah. And so and then as time goes on, he starts to really get it. And so this is an, these are some excerpts from a letter that he wrote to his leadership about what the church is going to do to deal with this issue. Because he's starting to see that we've missed the boat on this. This is a large church pastor writing to his, congrega- to his leadership. I am disturbed by the fact that women are coming forward telling me sad stories of long-term calculated abuse by their husbands. I am aware of six or seven cases that are current. These are good women who have experienced long-term, 10 to 25 years of abuse to varying degrees. In some cases, the abuse has been physical leading to domestic assault charges and imprisonment. In other cases, the abuse is more subversive, yet no less damaging. Emotional abuse, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, role abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse. Sometimes I wish they, <laughs> they would all just walk into my office with a black eye so that I could see the indisputable evidence and call the police. <laughs> Instead, They tend to walk in with blackened and bruised hearts that bleed pain. I thought that was really good. It is more difficult to discern the extent of non-physical abuse, but I am becoming more attuned to the signs of an emotionally and psychologically battered woman. These are not crazy women who are trying to find some sinister way to get out of a, a marriage, thus inventing false charges against their husbands. I'm talking about good and godly women who, over time, have lost hope that they will ever be treated with honor as a wife, a woman, or a fellow heir of grace, of the grace of life. I am typically taken off guard, thinking that their husbands were charming gentlemen of God. Oh, what a false front an abuser is able to display. <laughs> we all know there's a difference between difficult, a difficult marriage and a destructive marriage. We all have difficult marriages to some extent. 
There's no such thing as a pain-free, argument-free marriage. There's anger in every marriage leading to disputes, hurt feelings, and the need for healing. He's not, he says, I have not called this meeting to discuss difficult marriages. But I am talking today about destructive relationships where one person is being systematically and consistently broken down by the other. Now, there would be a good description for part of the emotional abuse that I'm talking about. I am most deeply disturbed by the fact that in several cases, these men are protecting their place within our church while the abused is made to feel like an outcast. The abuser sings in the choir, sits in the front row, leads the, in the men's ministry, carries the friendship uh, or, of, or support of a pastor or an elder, serves on some ministry team, plays in the band, while the wife is made to feel like an unforgiving, unsubmissive, self-willed, hardened sinner. The wife feels embarrassed around our church people, while the abusive husband smiles and drinks coffee with his boys. Wow. And I thought, there, no, there's a real life, there's a real life transition of a guy who, you know, he wants to do the right thing, but it's really hard to because, you know, people come in and you don't know if they're trying to work you, they're trying to manipulate you or what. But as we start to really get down to it, listen, someone who is in an abusive relationship, one of the, one of the things that abusers do is they, they never take responsibility. This is a key. And listen, as, as Christians, we should be leading the way in taking responsibility. Not uh, leading the charge in avoiding responsibility. And so when someone is, you're in a relationship with someone who never takes responsibility, or you can never get to a clear answer on a question, or there's a constant blame shift. You know, when you did that to me the other day, and, and you said that, and then the person says, well, I didn't because and everything was doing that. <laughs> and the next thing you know, it's your fault. The blame shifting, the avoidance, the minimization, the justification, the spiritualization. These things leave the person who's trying to make you know, reality understand this. They start to feel a little bit crazy. Wow. And they start to doubt themselves, which empowers the abuser all the more. And so here's the other thing I want to say is that <clears throat> in the church, what we've said, if you just love them more, if you just cook them the right meal, if you just have more sex with them, if you just, you know, be patient, then this will clear up. Listen, if you allow an abuser an inch, they will take a mile. The more you submit to their abuse, the more they're going to abuse. Because every abuser I've dealt with is in abject denial. All right, boy, this is loaded. Uh, and let me just say to our viewers and listeners now, you're welcome <clears throat> to call in, and you're welcome to remain anonymous. But before we take calls, that last comment is the one that I really struggle with when I have bumped into this in the past. Mm -hmm. How is it they can be in such denial? Mm -hmm. what, what is it? What is the psychic that allows an abuser to say, I'm not doing that? Well... Uh, first of all, anytime any of us do anything that goes against what we believe to be right, we have to practice some level of denial. And, and the reason why I say it's so important for people not to allow this to go on and to make the tough dis dis decision and have the tough uh, conversation and maybe destroy the relationship is because if you don't, the abuser will never see it. They need the pain of separation, of confrontation, of whatever, to, and that's the only hope they have of this thing breaking down. If you take David, for example, when he sh planned the whole thing about Bathsheba, he kills her husband, he's lying to everybody, he makes people think that he's taking her in out of the goodness of his heart when really he's the guy that was the murderer of her husband, but no one knows that because he was so slick. This is God's anointed leader. Mm -hmm. How did he get there? Well, and I've said this a lot of times, and I see this a lot with, like, particularly adultery. Listen, no one ever commits adultery like that. Mm. It starts months, maybe years before. Up here. Yeah, you know, and maybe you mm. pass a piece of paper to someone and your fingers touch a little longer than they should, or you hug someone and it lasts a second longer, too. And you just, you're just rationalizing and minimizing and justifying your way little by little by little. <clears throat> so... And then one day you end up in a situation where you're, where you're executing the sin. 
right? So this is the same way with abusers. They believe their own rhetoric. This is the crazy making part. They will stand right in front of you, look you dead in the eye and be very convincing because they believe it. And this is why it's people in that circumstance. Now, can a man be in this situation? Yes. But from my experience, it's it's vast majority women are the ones in this situation mm-hmm. because men generally have more power. They're more physically mm-hmm. competent, you know, in the, in the sense that they can intimidate. Um, and so this duplicity, you know, one person out in public and another person behind closed doors, right? So I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, I didn't want, I didn't want to hurt their reputation, which I totally understand in a normal relationship. <laughs> yeah. But when you're being systematically harmed, you have to put light on the behavior, okay? And listen, here's the thing. You, you, you have to be able, have to, I don't know if that's the right way to put it. I would encourage you to be able to put the relationship on the altar. And I see that a lot of times what people, what stops them from really digging into it is they're afraid they'll lose the relationship. And I say, you'd be better off losing an abusive relationship than you would be saving one. Okay. If you live outside of the abuse, whether you're married or divorced, you're better off than, and I say the abuser is better off to be confronted than to, to let that person go unabated without confrontation. That isn't loving. All right, we're talking about emotional abuse, and uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, the phone number locally, 541-776-5368. Outside the immediate area, you're welcome to join us. Toll free, 800 373 Five three six eight, and if you want to remain anonymous, we'll respect that request as well. We'll be right back with Patrick Doyle. Hi, I'm Paulina, and I work at the Deaf TV. Did you know that when you support the Deaf TV, you have a profound impact, not only in our community but around the world? It's your continued support that takes the inspiration and hope in the programs we produce and makes them available to the thousands of people who are watching these videos online every week. Help bring encouragement and hope to our valley and beyond by making a secure online donation today at our website, thedove.us. All right, we're we're back with uh, Patrick Doyle, and uh, today's subject is uh, certainly uh, a very um, difficult one. It's dealing with emotional abuse. And uh, again, um, if you've got some little ones around, this can get a little uh, um, difficult in some areas. You may want to scoot the kids out and find them something else to do. Or and if you want to be a part of the program, you want to call and ask questions, you're welcome to do that mm-hmm. or make comments. And um, if you want to remain anonymous, we'll certainly respect that as well. Mm-hmm. The local number, 541-776-5368. Mm-hmm. And the toll-free number outside the immediate area, 800-373-5368. All right. You made quite a statement in our closing remarks of that last break. It, it would be better to, well, first of all, you said put the relationship on the altar. Yes. It would be better to live outside of an abusive relationship than in it. Yep. It would be better for the abuser to be exposed and yep. to go on abusing. Yes. I get that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> from the time you recognize you're being abused to you actually do something about it, that's a lot of time. Sometimes, There's a lot of processing yep. in there. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> you often said there's only two things that make you change, yep. inspiration or desperation. Yep. And you reach a point you just can't take it anymore. Yep. And uh, that's when things usually mm-hmm. explode. And Is there any th- step before the explosion that can be taken? <clears throat> well, that's why I'm doing this show. Because I think a lot of times people, here's what I see all the time, is people um, feel in their soul, in their spirit, they're like, something's not right. Something's not right. Something's not right. But then they talk to the person. The person does all the rationalizing, blame shifting, denying. And and, um, um, they they put it back on the person who's asking. And so they go back and they're like, well, I don't know. I guess maybe. And then they go on and then it builds to a point and they're like, I don't know. And one of the things that I think where we've really failed in the church is we haven't helped those people listen to their spirit. We've told them, look, it can't be that this person's abusing you. It's not really that bad. Go back and just love them more, which is bad advice in some, with somebody who's abusive because they're just going to take advantage of that. So 
I want to help people in that circumstance listen to their spirit and say, no, there's something wrong. And you're not going to feel that for two years or six months. There's something wrong. And I want people, look, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather err on the side of believing somebody that there's something wrong than sending them back into an abusive circumstance. Mm-hmm. And so what we've done is we have, in deference to keeping the marriage together, I think, this is my opinion, as, as a church, w- what we've done is we've said, you know, just keep working on it. And really what I say is that, you know, what, to save the marriage, we have to take a look at, at maybe letting it be destroyed. And the marriage that's abusive, I hope, is destroyed so that we can have one that is actually healthy. Um, but they don't always survive, Perry. Uh, yeah, and I... I have I have been reluctant to get to that point. <laughs> uh, done enough counseling to realize that that is the case. Yeah, it's sometimes, for whatever reason, Perry, I don't know why, people don't repent. Well, that's where I was going to go next. Uh, Patrick, my struggle is this. How can a Christian be clean before God and live two lives? Yeah. My, they can't be. <laughs> well, your life is full of that. Yeah. That's what you deal with. Yeah. You deal with the phoniness of Christianity. Yeah. I deal with it on a limited basis, but yeah. i got to tell you, I, I go home at night and I talk to Peggy, I said, please tell me, have I lost my mind? What's going on? How in the world can people lie and right. cheat and and do these things and then go to church and raise their hands? I yeah. go, what's going on here? Right. Well, so here's, here's something I think where we've maybe missed a little bit of the boat about what how, how it works, and that is this. Look, Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Spirit. Mm-hmm. I'm leaving. I'm going to send you the Spirit. The Spirit's going to have two jobs. One job is to convict you of sin, what's right and what's wrong. And I would say conf- confirmation of the truth is involved in that. Mm-hmm. Okay. The other is he's going to comfort you. So when somebody comes to me and they say, I'm a believer and blah, 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 I'm like, great. And then I start looking to see if there's any conviction or there's any comfort in their life. If they don't have conviction and or comfort, I don't believe they have the Spirit. I don't care what they say. I don't care how many church services they go to. I don't care how much Bible they know. The evidence is in whether or not you're convicted. The conviction will lead to the fruit of the Spirit. Right? But you can feign the fruit of the Spirit for moments at church or in front of your pastor. Yeah. But, but behind closed doors with the person who knows you the best, if they're not the ones that are seeing it, then I'm really concerned. I don't care if the people at church believe you, because I could do that standing on my head. Mm-hmm. That's easy to pass. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so, and people do it every day. You know, I know, they do it. And so, here's the thing: if if your wife is feeling abused, I don't care if you're abuser or not. That's real, mm-hmm. and we have to deal with that. You know, and if it, if it turns out that she's misinterpreting something, great, it'll be easy fix. But if she's not then we can maybe heal the marriage before it absolutely destroys. And, you know, Perry, you and I both know that from, from a scriptural perspective, as Christians, one of our jobs is to confess our sins. Mm-hmm. If there's no confession in a marriage, if, if, a, if, a, if a husband never confesses on his own without being drugged into it, <laughs> they're not healthy. Yeah, the James chapter 5 thing says, uh, you know, confess your faults one to another. And I'll say this respectfully, but I think the Catholics and the Orthodox have this down better than we evangelicals, mm-hmm. because you got to go to them. Yeah. And, and we know the abuse is that, but the, yeah. the real part of that is yeah. it's very scriptural to go. Yes. And to confess to somebody. Now you're accountable. Yeah. Now mm-hmm. you're saying I'm 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 broken enough to mm-hmm. share this part, to put it on somebody else mm-hmm. who knows that about me. Yeah. Exactly. And of course their job is to take it to the Father. But I, I'm still. Pu- oh, let me back up. If if the abuser is, does it carry over from, say, a spouse to children? Oh, is, absolutely. Is, is, there's a pattern there? Absolutely. It's the way the abuser is the way he deals with people. Okay, so then the other thing you said was pretty interesting. A, a big sign of an abuser is they, take respon- they don't take responsibility they don't. for anything. No. Or they do this sham of a responsibility taking. <laughs> they say, oh, I'm sorry, or yeah, I know, I did that, and then they just keep on doing it. Listen, the, the evidence of conviction is a change mm-hmm. in your behavior, 
not your words, which is another thing, which is why I'm not a big fan. I don't like I'm sorry or I apologize. Look, God doesn't convict me in general. Mm -hmm. He convicts me specifically. So when you come to me, come to me with your specific sin. When I spoke to you harshly and called you this name, I confess that to you and I ask your forgiveness. That's very different than, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. And then the next day you do it again, and then the next day you do it again, or the, a week later you do it again. And so change behavior is the evidence of conviction. Mm. Not, not better words. And see, I see a lot of guys do this. They come to counseling and they learn some new language. And then they take that language <laughs> and they use it on their wife. Oh, that is so true. <laughs> and so, oh, that is so true. Because what they're trying to do is avoid responsibility. Yeah. When I see God break someone in conviction, I'm always hopeful. But when I see people dodging responsibility and making excuses and you know having pat answers and you know being smarmy or being falsely broken, I mean I've had people come in my office, Perry, men. There's one in particular I can remember. He'd had a couple of affairs on his wife. He had been torturing her emotionally for years. And he comes in after he gets caught. He didn't come forward. And that's another thing. If someone's coming forward out of conviction or being caught, you have two very different things happening there. Yeah. So he comes forward. I mean, he gets caught. They come to counseling. And he sits in my office. And I mean, he has a complete and total emotional meltdown, sobbing and begging and snot bubbles, the whole thing. <laughs> and then he keeps doing it. Yeah. So what did all that mean? You know, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. It meant nothing because the behavior kept going. Where does the conviction of the Holy Spirit come in? Well, that's, Are we so hard that we can just shun it? I, I seems like some people can. I, I, I don't know if it's because they're shunning it or because God ain't doing it. <laughs> it was from bad, some bad English for you. Um, so he backed off. I don't know if, I mean, listen, do I believe that God can convict somebody if he wants to? Yeah. Are we any match for that? No, mm. ask Paul. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Who can stand? It, no, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so sometimes I don't believe he does. The other thing is, sometimes I believe we let him off the hook by avoiding it. And the church is hugely guilty of this. I mean, we need to be calling guys on the carpet and saying, look, dude, come on. Your wife can't be saying this and there'd be nothing going on. Or your kids can't be saying this. And I'm telling you what, I can't tell you how many kids I've talked to who confirm for me what the wife is saying. And when that happens, I'm like, dude, <laughs> I don't care what you say. If you don't deal with this, I'm going to help deconstruct your marriage. Because you're, you're in no place to be continually harming the people that you supposedly love. All right, I, again, um, if you want to, it, it may be too heavy for you to call in, but uh, I, you're welcome to. 541-776-5368 or 800-373-5368. Before we take a break, let me ask you this, because you're doing a wonderful job describing the innermost feelings of somebody who's being abused mm -hmm. and what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, but what can we say to them when we come back? What can we say to them that begins them to say, all right, I, I've, I need to do so. I need to stop this. Great. What what's what's the first step to it? I okay. call you. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do I go to a pastor? Right. And <laughs> great uh, question. Um, well, well, I don't know if I want to say what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you see, what. I'm going to take a break and ask him it. if I can say what I'm going to say. <laughs> and if he gives me a green light, I'll say it on the other side of the break. How's that? We'll be right back. <laughs> uh, we're all safe. Hi, I'm Dan Lynn. I work at the Dove TV. You know, compared to Portland, Seattle, and LA, Medford might be considered a small market, but at the Dove, we're excited about the opportunity to make a big impact right here in our community. And you help make that happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us now by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or by phoning 541-776-5368. Okay, we're back, and uh, the subject today is emotional abuse, and this is a, a very difficult um, topic. And let me say that today's program uh, will be up on the Dove website a little bit later on. You may want to take it and share it with friends or look at it again and listen to it again. Uh, you're welcome to do that. That'll be at the Dove. It should be up there sometime late today or early tomorrow, and you can take that YouTube address and share it with friends. 
Patrick Doyle's here. He's with Veritas Counseling. And if you want to call us and remain anonymous, uh, we certainly get it. Uh, 541-776-5368. Or if you're listening and watching outside the immediate area, feel free to call as well. And that's 800. That's toll free. 800-373-5368. All right. When, when we were going to the break, I wanted to help us now transition into somebody that knows they're being abused. Yep. Uh, they're trapped. They really yep. don't know what to do. They fear the abuser. Right. And I think that's that fear or that intimidation mm -hmm. is a big part of their weaponry. You yep. know? It's mm -hmm. part of their arsenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but they're reaching a point where I got something's got to break here. Something's yep. got to stop. Mm -hmm. They and, recognize that it's coming to the head. Yeah. And boy, I say this with all due respect. I really do. Please don't send me a hot email. But sometimes. <laughs> Don't call the church. I don't know if the church is prepared for this. Well, that's the assessment that I think the person has to make. Mm -hmm. um, somebody has to know what they're doing. And secondly, somebody has to be willing to get involved. You know, and this is where I see that we, we, we stumble. If somebody comes to counseling, you know, obviously I can get involved to a certain degree. But really, I think where the church has the, has the ability to really be transformational is to, is to get involved in a big way with other people you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, that's how we could really help these people. And, and, you know, in my church, we've set up funds to support women temporarily, to give them money so the abusive husband can't control them financially. I've seen it a thousand times. I've seen it once, Perry. That's where it happens first. Yeah, they start, they start controlling the money. And, and you know, what's, what's somebody going to do? Mm -hmm. How are they going to live? I mean, that's, those are real questions. And so... That's where we can come balance the power, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, if you're in this situation and you're sitting there thinking, you know, I think that I'm in an abusive relationship, first thing I want you to do is talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about, somebody who has some idea of this. And I don't know, I mean, I've gotten a lot of email from around the country and actually the world mm. from this topic. And so I don't know the communities that some people might be in, but. But you, you have to discern whether or not they understand what they're talking about. And, and here's the other thing. If you go to someone who's going to get involved and then back away, <laughs> oh. that is way worse. Mm. In, in that case, I would say don't even, don't even broach the subject until you know you have support that's, that's going to stay. Mm -hmm. Because, and this is, I think the church has done a lot of damage with they'll get involved for a minute and then back out. Once it gets a little too uncomfortable, they back away and they feel over their head and whatever. Um, so, you know, you have to be careful about that and do a little research. You know, ask around the community, you know, and take what you learn maybe from this program and, and see if you can find a place that's safe. But here's the thing you're going to need long term support. Because I've never seen an abuser who's gotten that far that goes, oh, you're right. I'm going to quit. <laughs> All right. Now, I, I, on the flip side of this, um, after reading this email from this pastor, you, um, it's possible that churches get it and they yeah. do want to get yes. involved in this. And that church is a great example. Yeah. That they recognize this is something mm -hmm. in the church and, and they the church set up, to address it. They set, up, they set up in that church, he set up an entire program and I don't mean program like a program but he he started training staff he started changing the way they looked at it he started you know he himself got some training because they care about the people yeah and 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 that's what's going to be required all right let's take some calls here and again uh, we want to remain anonymous hi ma'am you're on the air go ahead hi, hi. um I you know, I have a question here, and I know I'm missing something, but I cannot put it together, so I was hoping Patrick could do that for me. Right. In uh, First Peter, in chapter 2, verse uh, 18, where it's talking about servants, you must respect your masters and do whatever they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, mm -hmm. but even if they are tough and cruel. Praise mm -hmm the Lord if you're punished for doing right. Of right. course, you get no credit. All right, you know what I'm referencing. Yes. How does that work with a marriage? You're, 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 not, in a, you're not in a slave-master relationship. The marriage is supposed to be a reflection of the character of God. And if someone's abusing you, that does not reflect the character of God. And, okay, so it's just the title you have that you carry then, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to see, if you're looking at marriage as, as slave master, you're looking at it wrong. Besides, two Well, become... not slave master, 
but like a servant, because mine says servant. Okay, are- servant, but again, that's not how, God doesn't, there's, God does not value women less than men or men less than women. It's two people that he created, male and female. They both have intrinsic value because he made them. And then the two become one. There's not any hint of, um, you know, hierarchy there. There are definitely very distinct roles, but your role does not mean that you take it. Okay? Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, let's see. Hi, ma'am, go ahead. Hi. Lady number two. Oh, hello? Yeah, go Hi. ahead. Okay, um, I need you to tell me what to do. I'm in a, a emotionally abusive marriage. Um, me and my husband are 60 years apart. How many? Are we 60, six, zero. Six, zero. Mm. Yes, he's in his 80s, I'm in my 20s, mm. and we've been together six years, married four. Mm-hmm. We have two kids, very, very, very young. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's retired, so we live on Social Security. I don't work. I take care of the kids. When we fight, he tells me. <sighs> Okay. I'm sorry. Um, it's all right. Boy, Take a deep breath. He's, he's always kicking me out of the house, and I really have no place to go. My family lives, oh, very, very far, and it's not easy to live with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't just show up with two kids. He, mm-hmm. he recently told me he will beat me to death if I call the cops again, and that he can tie me up in the kitchen. And, and do that there, and that he can disfigure me, that he can shoot me in the knee, so I'm never the same. Mm. Uh, somebody told me, a, a family law facilitator said that he sounds like uh, he plays mind games. Yeah, definitely. That he just wants to keep me at home, doesn't want me to really leave, but he does tell me to leave, and so I really don't know what to do. I don't have money, like, like you mentioned, you know, that's a big problem with women, just Mm-hmm. to leave because of the money thing and mm-hmm. so I, I yeah. because of the age difference I also and he's a decent dad though and this, sorry but he can't be a decent dad if he's treating you that way that's a, that's a little bit of a denial thing he's a horrible dad if he's treating the mother of his children the way he's treating you uh-huh. So, I mean, let's let's be realistic. Do you have any? Do you have any friends? Any people that you can talk to honestly that would understand what's going on? Yes, I have a couple of ladies that I speak to, and they understand. One of them is a Jehovah's Witness. She really wants me to try to work things out, but she understands. If mm-hmm. She supports me either way. Is there anybody um, that you? Is there anybody that you could live with? No, not that I can think okay. of right so now. So then what you're going to have to do from here on out is start looking for an exit strategy. You've got to start setting yourself up so that you're safe. He has basically said to you that it's going to be his way or you're going to suffer, right? Yes. Okay, so you have to stop living in hope or denial and start living in reality. You have a job to protect two children. This guy is mm-hmm. not well. And I don't know where you're at, if you're in the area here or somewhere else, but, you know, call my office and we can have a a conversation at length and um, try to help you secure a safety plan. That's one of the things that you're in a situation where you need a safety plan and you need one relatively quickly because you're being threatened with physical harm. And um, I I would consider making a report. I called the police and they said it's because it's just words and mm-hmm. he's my husband, we're married. Mm-hmm. But, um, they but, you can't know, kick him out of the house, you know. I understand, and, but the fact that you made a report mean, means it's on file and that's mm-hmm. helpful. So that's good that you did that and that's, that's excellent. So we just need to help, somebody needs to sit down with you and help you sort of ferret some of this out. And I, mm-hmm. I need more details to help yeah. you build a better plan. Let, let, me okay. give you a, let me give you a number here, okay? Okay. Number 622. Six six zero one eight, and the area code's five four one. Um, the other thing is, is that when you call, just tell my assistant that you spoke to me on the radio today and or the TV, and she'll okay. she'll okay. Ha- she'll set you up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, that epitomizes everything we're talking about. Absolutely. 
as a living example. All right, let me see if I can squeeze in one more before we take a break. Hi, sir. You're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Hey, good. Um, I'm calling as um, as a perpetrator of the abuse. Mm. Not current, necessarily, but um, there's been a cycle in our marriage. And I just, um, I don't know if there's anything that, that you could give me as far as, you know, repeated cycles and how to break that. That's, you know, uh, you know, the prayer and the submission and how to really come in to that submission. That's what I'm asking for this morning. As, okay. And confessing publicly. Right. Well, you know, not knowing a lot of the circumstances that you're in, um, two things I see happen. One is is that we come into the marriage and we, we, we sort of move into the abusive patterns because we have stuff in us that's kind of powerful. And I know that from my upbringing, being raised by an abusive man who was, you know, emotionally and physically abusive, I learned some things about how to deal with people <laughs> in a way that's not healthy. So I had to start to deal with that in conjunction with also getting myself in a situation where I could talk to another man, somebody with some wisdom, who could tell me like it was instead of me just believing my own rhetoric. And I don't know if you have that or not, but I would highly suggest that you try to find a situation where you can start to get, and I, what I mean is you getting honest and talking about those thoughts that no one else knows about. I've done that to a degree. I've actually talked to you before a few years back. Good. Um, Good. And I've done that to a point. There seems to come a point where this is really re where fear ends up taking over my belief in my father. Yeah, exactly. You know? And it's like, is he going to be just like everybody else? I know he's not. Right. My mind knows he's not. Yeah. But my core and my roots yeah. are really distorted still. And this has been like years. Yeah. This has been well, like years of this. And, I, and it's yeah. not physical. It's not... But right. there's still some areas that that any time that she is not okay, it's not okay with me. Right. And yet, it happens again. Yeah. And so I would say that there's a, there's some more work for you to do on the inside, and and that will help you deal with the stuff that is coming out. And so when you say that fear, I totally get what you're saying. I understand how how like unconscious that can be, and you're like two miles down the road of the behavior sometimes before you realize what's happening. And yeah, like I said, right now there's there's sort of a honeymoon because we've just had a big a major issue happen, and and now I'm good. This is where I want to stay, where I'm at with us right now. Right, letting her heal, letting you know. But yeah. anyway, right. so I just want to throw that out there, okay. you know that that and to anybody who is going through it for years and years and years, you know, you can get past it. But you're right. Okay. I I know God loves me. Man. Good. I know God loves all of us. Thank you. But yet, I know the but. I know. Get my butt out of the way, but <laughs> uh, anyway, got to scoot to a break. Uh, thank you. Um, mm. Let me take a quick break. Anyway, you can see how um, heavy this is, and uh, we'll be right back with Patrick Doyle. Hi, I'm Paula, and I work at the Dove TV. Every day, we get letters and emails from people who've been encouraged, blessed, and challenged by the programs on the Dove TV. But we couldn't do it without you. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to bring inspiration and hope to our community by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or call us at 541-776-5368. All right, we're back. Uh, Patrick Doyle's with us today, and uh, again, a very sensitive topic, uh, dealing with abuse, emotional abuse primarily, and and um, uh, I just want to remind you that today's program is being recorded and it'll be on the Dove website at the Dove.us uh, there under the archives and on a YouTube file and you'll be able to view it again or maybe share it with some friends and we recommend that you uh, take the opportunity to do that. Our phone number is 541-776-5368 or toll free 800-373-5368 and you're more than welcome to join us today and uh, Join the conversation. If you want to remain anonymous, we'll respect that. Well, you lit up the phones. <laughs> uh, before we go back to the phone calls, I mean, you're seeing the obvious patterns. Yeah. Everything yep. pretty much explains what you... Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, sir. You've been on the line for quite a while. What's your question today? Yes. Uh, thank you for taking my call, and I appreciate the discussion today. And, and uh, of course, the last few uh, comments have been, you know, very clear and my, my question to you, I'm going to take it off air, is you've been talking about male abuse on the female spouse. Yeah. 
And the albatross around the church's neck the last few decades has been just the opposite, and I've talked to numerous counselors about this, the opposite, and that is the female's abuse of the male spouse. Mm-hmm. And I've talked to numerous female counselors about this in terms of bullying. Mm-hmm. And the husband is the lover. The husband is the one that wants peace in the house. Mm-hmm. The husband loves his wife. Mm-hmm. But the wife bullies. Mm-hmm. Not only does she bully, but she goes around and then she tells everybody in the church and everybody else that it's the husband, that it's the abuser. Mm-hmm. She does her thing, just like Patrick was talking about just a while ago. Everything mm-hmm. else outside, mm-hmm. yeah. right? The marriage yeah. is is this scam, yeah. right? It's this godly appearance. Right. But I can't tell you how many countless other men I have talked to who've been bullied mm-hmm. by their wives constantly, yeah. and the church does not address it. Now take your comment. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. I, I I get that. Yeah. I've had it in my office. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's legitimate. In the same in the same in the same um, solution applies. You have to confront that. It, and it's, this, it's the same bailiwick either way, whether it's a man or a woman, is you have to confront that if the person's unwilling to confess you know, you have to be willing to put that relationship on the line. Because the denial is what has to be broken, whether it's the guy or whether it's the girl, whether it's the man or the husband or wife. And so when someone is campaigning, if you will, uh, and, and slandering another person's character, I, I can think of, like he said, I can think of several cases that I've dealt with recently where this is the case, where the woman just won't be quiet. They just keep slandering and slandering and slandering and and um, you know, in a private so the respect is gone. It, yeah, and oh, and no. so, but you have to confront that, and and the healing I hope will come to the to the offender with enough confrontation. It'll either a end the marriage, and I hate to say that, but then the person gets to heal that's being abused, male or female, and and in the process of confrontation, if it doesn't end in a destruction of the relationship. It ends in the repentance of the individual. And really, that's my thing, is that I hope and pray that the person who's doing the offending will break. That's the greatest victory. Uh, uh, before I take our last call here, there's a part of this equation that's very, very difficult. Yeah. And that is you, the counselor, trying to discern who's telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I know it's an abuse. The, the, the defenses are real high. Mm-hmm. And it takes right. quite a few sessions to mm-hmm. plow through that to yeah. figure out, wait a minute, who really is the perpetrator yeah. here? Because well, they're both got well, the and, finger pointed at each other. And nobody's, nobody's innocent. Right. And there's, you know, in my defensiveness, I may perpetrate. But and again, and I think if, if, a, if a man is, is uh, loving his wife, you know, if she's not pathologically damaged, we're going to be okay. Okay. Let me squeeze in one more call quickly. Uh, let's see. Hi, ma'am. Uh, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. I just have a quick question. Um, what advice would you give to adult children whose mom's going through emotional abuse? Mm. Have you talked about it with her? Oh yeah, we've been helping her out. What, her marriage is what keeps her from what keeps her from taking definitive action. Um, she's moving out. They're selling property. There's court trials going on because he mm. was physically violent with her, and she mm. reported it, and you know, so on and mm. so forth. But I don't know. We feel that she doesn't really listen to it. Uh, mm-hmm. but she'll listen to other people. Mm-hmm. Well, that might be a little bit of, of a longer discussion. You know, I'd have to know a little bit about the con- the context of the relationship between you and your mom or your mom and the rest of your siblings. But one of the things I would tell you is that if your mom has been in an abusive relationship, she also has a significant level of denial. It's just how we survive it. 
So one is I would have you, I would have you understand that that's the case and that it, you're talking about a long-term solution. You're not talking about something that's short-term. And if your mom does indeed get away from the abuser, what's going to happen is she's going to go through what I call a detox period, where she's going to start to emotionally detox from all of the, the lies and the control and the fear, whatever he was using. And as that happens, you might find that she opens up a little bit. Okay. But one of the things is, uh, that I think she's probably experiencing, this is my experience talking here, I don't know for sure, but when you're in that circumstance, you're embarrassed. Yeah. And so. Now I have and you, one you more question. Okay. Um, this is her third mm -hmm. marriage and her second abusive one. Mm -hmm. Is she in danger of maybe coming across another abusive relationship? Absolutely. If she doesn't get some help, the, the probability is higher that she'll get back into a bad relationship than, than not. And so she has some real internal work to do um, because you can't go through that much abuse and not, and not leave its mark. So yeah. I would really vote for her to, to stay outside of relationships and work on her and, and deal with those situations so that she loses the attraction to the pain. And oddly enough, you know, those of us that have been abused, we, we gravitate to it because we feel like it's what we deserve. And it's not, that's not a conscious belief, but you see it play out like in somebody like your mom's life where she keeps making decisions that are pretty easily uh, visible to those around her thank that you. aren't good. Thank you. i got to scoot. I'm almost out of time. Thank Alrighty, you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bet. you. Okay. All right. So what few moments we have left. If somebody recognizes through our discussion today that all right, this describes yeah. the atmosphere. Yeah. What do they do? What's step one? Well, first, you have to, I think one of the first things I would do is I would look for assets. What assets do I have in terms of support? Who do I know that I can talk to who, A, will keep a confidence, mm. that I can go to and let this out, and they won't go tell everybody, or they won't tell anyone, and they'll hold it. Two, so, because here's the deal. I think what, uh, what people in that situation have to do is they have to get some confirmation that they're not crazy. Mm -hmm. They have to get some confirmation that I am seeing this right. And once that begins to happen, then, then the road sort of starts to develop. Okay, so now my next step is this and my next step is it. And you can see people are in all kinds of different circumstances. Some people have assets financially, some people don't. Some people are in physical harm, some people are not. And so having someone help you understand the dynamics of that are really important for you to build a plan of um, an exit strategy and also build a plan of confrontation. And, and I, I always want a plan of confrontation because I don't want someone just leaving without telling the abuser what's going on because I care for the abuser too. I want them to have a chance at breaking the cycle and changing who they are. And as we had one guy call and say, you know, that's, that's what he's going through is he's, he's in the process of trying to change. Well, you know, and again, on all of this, there's no guarantee that we're all going to ride off into the sunset. Yeah. And that's the other thing that I want people to say. And I, and I wish that the church would um, embrace this, <laughs> which is that, you know, it's not our job to control the outcome. Our job is to do what's best in the circumstance and let God be in charge of the outcome. I can't let keeping the marriage together guide me in this moment. I can't let that be an idol. Because uh, that would temper what you would say. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, if, is God for marriage? Absolutely. So he'll work it out. <laughs> but he won't work it out if we lie to ourselves and don't confront it. I also learned, and you probably have too in counseling, the moment you take it on, you, run the, you now have put that relationship between you and that person on the table. That's exactly right. Because for a whole set of circumstances. But, yeah. Well, this is fascinating, called um, you know, emotional abuse. And again, let me just encourage you that if the, today's been uh, beneficial to you, that this program will be on the Dove website at the Dove.us. You can go there later and uh, get the YouTube address and watch it again and share it with your family members or friends. If you're listening on radio, let me encourage you to go to the Dove website, grab the video version of it, and take, take a look and watch it again. Thank you, Patrick. You bet. My pleasure. We'll see you next time on Focus Today. Hi, I'm Jim and I work at the Dub TV. Every weekday between 6 and 8 a.m., our award-winning news and sports team bring you the best morning show around. It's live, it's honest, and it's a whole lot of fun. And you help make it happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? 
you can help us continue to air local programs that share your voice by making a secure online donation at our website, thedub.us.